Greetings, I'm Michael Genovese. I'm the president of the Global Policy Institute at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, I specialize in the study of the American presidency. I've written about 50 books uh, on the topic. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk with you about uh, the way we select our presidents. And the title of the talk is, Is This Any Way to Select the World's Most Powerful Leader? Spoiler alert, no. Um, if I'm a little bit off my game today, I apologize. I, I, I had a rough night. I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning this morning to hear my wife screaming in the other room. And so I ran into the other room, and she's in the TV room. And she's screaming, get out, get out, run, get out while you can, get out while you can. She was watching our wedding video, and uh, that's just an old joke. Never throw away an old joke. Um, I am, as I mentioned, a presidency scholar. It's my main field of inquiry. Um, and because of that, people are always asking me, who's going to win the next election? It's a very common question. And political scientists have done a lot of research on this, and they have a number of theories to predict who will win. There is one that is especially efficacious, and that is, um, it sounds a little odd, but it's the number of, of bumper stickers, the number one bumper sticker sold in Washington, D.C. The winner of that has always, since the 1940s, won the presidential race. I know it sounds odd, but whatever is the best-selling bumper sticker, that's the, the winner. Um, it's still not quite election time, but it's getting close. And so at this point, um, the record would go to, to Joe Biden. There's a, a bumper sticker that says, Run, Joe, Run. And a lot of people are buying the Run, Joe, Run bumper sticker. Um, the weird thing is a lot of Republicans are buying it and putting it on the front of their car. So you take that as you will. Anyway, uh, I always start off my presidency classes with presidential trivia to see just how smart my students are. They're pretty smart. Uh, so let's see if you're as smart as my, uh, uh, my students. Who is the shortest president in history? Shout out the answer if you know it. James Madison. Here's an easier one. The tallest. That's right, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the only bachelor president, James Buchanan. Uh, who is the youngest president at time of inauguration? Most of you will say Kennedy. He was the youngest ever elected. The youngest inaugurated was Teddy Roosevelt, who when McKinley died, he took over. Um, so who's the, who is the first divorced president? Ronald Reagan. Um, who is the first presidential candidate of the Republican Party? John C. Fremont. Most people say Lincoln. Lincoln was not the first. He was the first successful one. Who is the first president to earn a PhD? Woodrow Wilson. He was also the first president to coach a college football team, Princeton University. Here's a tough one. So I'm going to give you a second to answer it. Which presidents are not buried on U.S. soil? Which U.S. presidents are not buried on U.S. soil? Well, Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, you know, all the ones that are alive, obviously. So now your, your children get that, so why don't you? All right. Um, I, want, I want to focus on the way we select presidents as the reason for our dysfunctional uh, politics that sometimes happens. And, and part of the reason is because we get presidents who may have qualities that, while it helps the, the qualities that help them get elected, they may not help them in governing. Those are two different political universes. There's some overlap. But uh, the great political scientist, James McGregor Burns. James McGregor Burns was the, gosh, he was a, the, the godfather of presidential studies. He, He's the only person in history, I think, who was ever elected president of the American Political Science Association and the American Historical Association. Uh, an enormous figure, monumental. Um, and, and one of the things that Burns did, he's, he, was, he was a student of the presidency, and if you ever want to read a terrific pair of books, his two book series on Franklin Roosevelt during the Depression and during wartime is just magisterial. Anyway, 
he probably knew, and he, he died a few years ago, um, he probably knew as much about the presidency as anyone, including the people who served in the office. And he said that the way that America selects its top leader is the worst leadership selection system in the advanced world. Now, uh, give him a few degrees for hyperbole, but it's quite a statement. Part of the reason that he was willing to say something like that is because we have a unique system. No other country in the world has modeled their selection process after ours. Is he right? If he's not right, he's not far off. Let me put it that way. And I think, you know, uh, reasonable people could disagree about that. But when the smartest guy in the world on a particular field says something, you ought to take notice. Um, Adley Stevenson, who ran for presidency twice in the 50s and lost both times to Eisenhower, was, was out giving a speech on the stump once, and in the middle of the speech, a woman yells, Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson, all thinking people are voting for you. To which Stevenson responded, well, that's great, but I need a majority. Well, the answer is you don't need a majority. Uh, I wish you did, because our electoral college system allows candidates who lose to win. And so I want to, I want to focus on the electoral college, but before that, there are three basic ongoing criticisms of the way we select presidents. And I'll be very brief. The process is too long, too costly, too superficial. Too long. Well, we take over two years to select a president. Two years when virtually all you can do is run for president. Who, who would do that? Who would take two years out of their lives? A period where you know you're hardly going to see your family. You won't see your son's ballet class or your daughter's soccer match. You may not even make graduation. You'll miss all the key events of their lives. You may make it home for Christmas, Thanksgiving. But you're going to be running for office pretty much 24-7. Well, who in his right mind? Who, who, what person with a balance in their lives would do that? What, what normal person would do that? The answer is you wouldn't. And so the people who are attracted to the office are people who are so hungry for the office that they probably don't deserve the office. Uh, Adlai Stevenson again once said, anyone who could become president didn't deserve the office. I, it is one of my rules in life, and I practice it every four years when we have a change in departmental chair, is anyone who really wants the office badly should be the last person you give it to. That has been borne out in, in my experience, both in the department and in life. People who are too hungry for it usually want it for the wrong reasons. Richard Nixon, a perfect example. So they're too long. In Britain, they held a national election in six weeks. Six weeks. Now, they have a different party system, so they already have the candidates selected and they already have the party platform ready to go. But think about it. Six weeks versus two years plus. And so most normal human beings, most people who have balance in their lives, most people who have families and, and are devoted to their families would not put themselves through that or their families through that. The story um, that I heard from several people is that uh, when Barack Obama was considering a race for the presidency, uh, his wife, Michelle, was dead set against it. And she said, you know, you're, you're not going to see your family. Your two daughters are young. They're going to grow up. You, you will miss some of the formative experiences in their lives. Um, no, I don't want you to do it. And so he finally came up with a deal. He said, look, how about if I give every Sunday to family day? I promise every Sunday. Finally, she said yes. The promise lasted two weeks. Because you can't make a promise like that and still be considered a, a viable candidate or president. I want to give both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, kudos because they both really tried very hard to maintain their family and connection to their family. Uh, in fact, Barack Obama was often criticized because he would have dinner at home with the family and not watch schmoozing with Mitch McConnell. Uh, 
uh, people used to say, you, you, you ought to go and have a beer with Mitch McConnell. And his response was, do you really want to have a beer with Mitch McConnell? Um, and so I think it's true that, that his devotion to family diminished his capacity to be effective. Presidents schmooze every day, all day. That's their job. They have to devote 24-7 and 100% to it. And if you are distracted, that's probably the wrong word, but if you are distracted by family, then, then, you're, then you're probably going to choose the side of power and not family. And so being such a long process to get elected probably dissuades some very good, capable people from seeking the office. Any system that rewards people who are sort of weak on family and punishes people who are strong on family, that's a problem. Um, the second major criticism is that presidential elections are so expensive. Ours are the most expensive in the world. Candidates and campaigns say, well, that's because television costs so much. And it's true, television costs a lot. And we're a big country, but it is so outrageously and grotesquely uh, overspending that, that what you see is that um, presidential candidates spend, on average, on average, over four hours a day raising money for the two years prior to the election. Four hours a day. And does that money come with strings attached, with expectations? I tell you right now, if I called Donald Trump, I couldn't get to talk to him. But if his big donors called him, they'd go through right away. What kind of a system allows for that? Ours does. Um, and it's not Democrats or Republicans, it's both. The system is the problem. The system allows corruption to be legal. So our politicians are for lease. Uh, politicians will deny that. They will say that they, they you know, will vote against the moneyed interest. But money buys access. And access buys the ability to persuade and pressure. Doesn't mean big money always wins, but it means it's got the head seat at the table and there are very few people sitting with them at the table. And so, um, Think about it. Um, would you spend over two years running for the office, and would you spend four days, four hours every day begging for money? Money that you know comes with strings attached. Now, we do have campaign finance laws, and I was good. I didn't laugh when I said that. Um, they're a joke. There are all kinds of routes around it. You, there are so many loopholes in our campaign finance laws, you could drive a Mack truck through it and wouldn't muss up anybody's hair. Um, John McCain, to his credit, tried and failed to get serious campaign reform through when he was alive. Why would the people who are benefiting from the current corrupt system want to change that system and reward their potential rivals? So it's too long, it's too costly, it's also too superficial. We tend to vote on personality more than policy, party more than uh, policy. And, and we, we tend to, to sort of focus on the trivial more than the substantive. Look at presidential debates. They are, they're not really debates. And what are they? They are, you just have canned responses that you've already prepared. A real debate, if you want to have one, is to sit down with a moderator and, say, and the moderator says, okay, today we're going to talk for 20 minutes about, you name it, but how we're going to balance the federal budget. In the last campaign, how much time did Hillary Clinton and Bill and Donald Trump combined spend on focusing on the national debt and the budget deficit? Close to zero. It's a huge issue. We are overspending and giving the bill to our children. Um, our young students today are mired in debt. They face a, an economic future that doesn't show signs of promise and hope for them. The job market's terrible. Oh, and we're also going to dump a huge budget deficit on your shoulders. Um, we have been driving ourselves to the poorhouse on credit cards 
and we're driving there in a nice new expensive car. But when the credit card comes due, we'll be gone. Our children will have to pay for that. So we tend not to focus on real issues. Did we focus on Russia in the campaign last year? Or, uh, excuse me, last time around? Bumper sticker lines. That's all we use. And so if you really want to deal with the problems at hand, you have to talk about the problems at hand. And when you run for office, you say, I'm committed to solving these problems in this way. To, to have as your big campaign thing, I'm going to build a wall and I'm going to lock up my opponent. Okay. So those are three of the, the big problems that we, we see recurring and recurring. But I want to focus on one uh, just for a few minutes uh, that I hadn't mentioned much of, and it's the Electoral College. The Electoral College. Why do we have it? What does it do? And why is it a problem? Uh, when they tried to invent a way to select our president back in 1787, they were unsure of what to do because they were creating a new office, a Republican with a small r presidency. In the past, leadership selection and secession was pretty simple. The king, when he died, the oldest son took over. Um, that solved your problem for the most part. But in the United States, how do you select a president for a Republican position in a Republican government? At first they thought, well, let's have the legislature pick it. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. These are people who know what they're doing and about they were elected. Um, the problem with that is that if you had a separation of powers model where one branch was designed to check the power encroachments of another, if the Congress got to choose the president, then the president would be underneath the Congress, would be the errand boy of Congress, would be dependent on Congress, and so would basically do the Congress's bidding. So you wouldn't have two separate quasi-independent institutions. So they threw Congress out. The next, some people suggested, well, what about the people? When I say that the framers did not believe in democracy, people go, oh, there's one of those liberal professors trashing America. Uh, I find such comments offensive because they're so wrong. Um, very few of the framers believed in democracy, and it's not a surprise, because even at that time, democracy was still a dirty word. When the framers are trying to set up a Republican form of government, and they looked around the globe, did they see democracies to model their system after? No, there, there weren't democracies. In history, there were very few democracies, and those which existed, according to the framers, were short of duration and violent in their ending. And so they were, they were suspicious of giving too much power to the people. They didn't want a democracy. And I could give you 300 quotes from the, the framers, okay, 200, from the framers that, that confirmed this view. Uh, and it's not because I'm criticizing them. They were people in large part of their times. In fact, they were ahead of their times in a lot of respects because they were creating this new Republican form of government based on checks and balances, a separation of powers, and the rule of law. So they were ahead of their times but not so far ahead of their times as to think that democracy was a good thing because every, virtually everyone from Plato on thought it was a bad thing. It led to mob rule. That would lead to anarchy. It was unstable. It would not last. And so you don't want the Congress. You don't want the people. What's left? Somebody came up with this idea of prominent citizens, prominent citizens, non-office holders, but who are prominent in their communities eminent people. And Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers, uh, number 68, is defending the Electoral College by saying the following, that the presidential selection method, in his words, affords, affords a moral certainty that the office of president will never fall to the lot of any man who is not in an eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications. It will not be too strong to say that there will be a constant probability of seeing the station, the office, filled by characters preeminent in ability and virtue. Apparently Hamilton was a better Broadway uh, performer than he was a, a philosopher. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't have a good method. They chose the Electoral College. 
the Electoral College almost immediately came into disrepute because the Constitution was poorly structured and they had to have the 12th and 13th Amendments very soon after the country was established to change it. But what, it really, what really happened is they kept the structure and then the party system changed everything. And so the Electoral College now does not serve the purpose it originally was designed to serve, and it probably thwarts democracy in a way that makes it really um, unacceptable to most Americans. In fact, poll after poll says that people think they should eliminate um, uh, the Electoral College. Uh, but the Electoral College just simply means that you we don't vote for president. It's a sort of a, a staggered vote. We vote for these candidates, but those candidates aren't really the ones that we vote for. We're voting for electors in each state. And each state then, every year in December, they send their electors to the state capitol. They have a nice lunch. They vote. And then the votes are transferred to Congress. And Congress either accepts what they do or it doesn't accept the results. Why do we, why do we continue to do that? Um, there are certain problems with that system uh, that have come to the forefront uh, in recent years, probably the, the most prominent of which is that, number one, the loser often wins. Well, not often, sometimes wins. 2000. Al Gore, more votes. W. Bush, the president. 2016. Hillary Clinton wins by 2.9 million votes. There's democracy for you. And she loses. The same thing could happen in 2016. Donald Trump could lose by 4 million votes and still win the office because of the Electoral College. The Electoral College gives, except for two states, gives all of the votes to the winner. So therefore, in California, California is a blue state. California is going to go for, for Biden. Republicans literally have zero stake in that. And because of the Electoral College, it favors certain states and punishes others. California is getting hurt by this. Because you proportion your electoral college by state legislators, uh, nationally. So you have con members of Congress and two senators. A small state, therefore, has excessively high range, range of power, whereas this California, the big states, are diminished in power. Let me give you an example. Um, voters in Wyoming have four times as much influence over the presidential choice as voters in California. Does that seem fair? We, we, we say we believe in one person, one vote, but we don't practice it. Um, let me give you the, the numbers. The smallest state in the Union by population is Wyoming with 563,000 voters. The largest is California with 37 plus million. Therefore, what happens is this small state is advantaged and the large state is disadvantaged. That also, if you want to put it in partisan terms, is a great advantage for the Republicans because Democrats tend to win most of the big cosmopolitan areas and large population areas. Republicans do better in rural areas. So, they, they have an advantage by winning a lot of small states rather than a couple of the big states. Uh, it gives them an advantage, and you saw it in 2000, you saw it in 2016. Uh, Donald Trump, our, our incumbent president, before he won through the Electoral College, said, quote, and, and I'm quoting, that the Electoral College, quote, was a disaster for democracy. I completely agree with, with my president. Uh, and he called for a popular vote to select a president. Five times in our history, the loser has won. Uh, John Quincy Adams in 1824. Adams in that election got 30.5% of the popular vote, and he won. Then Hayes in 1876, on the basis of a fraudulent deal, they used to call him his fraudulency because he made a deal to get electoral votes. Benjamin Harrison in 1888, W in 2000, and in 2016, Donald Trump. So what do you do? One method is to have simply direct popular election of the president. Some people say that, well, that's going to undermine the party system. But our job isn't to prop up a corrupt party system. Our job is to elect a person fairly. And so a direct election is one good way. But if you're so committed to the Electoral College, I have another way to do it. Simply distribute the electoral votes by proportion, not by winner-take-all in the states. So California goes 60-40 for Biden, 
Biden gets 60%, Trump 40%. If Wyoming goes 51-49 for Trump, they both get about the same number of electors. So, so I would just say no winner take all. That would help a lot. It wouldn't make it us a perfect system. It would certainly move us in the direction we say we want to go into, we claim to be a democracy. Let's move in that direction. Thank you very much. And before you vote, read the Constitution, read the Declaration of Independence, and read Abraham Lincoln's two inaugural addresses. That'll set you up to vote for the next president. Thank you very much for your time and your, your kind attention.